G'day. I've got a confession to make. I have an addiction. An addiction to luxury watches. I've been collecting them for, well, well over 40 years now. And whilst it's certainly not up in the upper echelons of F1 watches like Hublot's and Richard Mill, it's an interesting collection I think you'll enjoy today. And I want to run you through what I've got here and uh, see what you think. So here they are. So this is my collection of watches. Now, start you off with the very first one, which was a Seiko. My grandmother brought it back from Hong Kong, and it still works today. I've had the glass replaced once on it, but I have fond memories of this watch. So that was my first $20 watch. So this is a Rolex Daytona. It's a white face. I bought this in 1994. This is the one with the Zenith movement. Now, for watch aficionados, that will make some sense to you. I was in the mall in Perth and I walked past and saw a gold one, a very expensive Daytona. So I walked into the store and said, how much is that? And they said, oh, a lot of money. I thought, oh, okay, got out of that, don't have to buy it. And he said, what are you after? I said, oh, I was really after the stainless steel one because I'd seen an article in GQ magazine about it and thought perhaps that's the watch to own. But anyway, he walked out the back, came back and said, is this what you want? And I said, yes. He said, how come you've got that? And he goes, well, the guy that we had it aside for hasn't come in and paid for it. Do you want it? So I went outside, rang my wife and said, what do you think? They've got one here at 7,000 Australian dollars. She said, buy it. I bought it. Today, it's probably worth 37, maybe 40. Could even be more than that. One of the greatest watches you'll ever own because of its hard to get status. This is a Swatch watch. Once again, inexpensive watch, but great because it has a uh, timer. Stop, start, reset button on the outside here. Very sturdy watch, cheap too. I think I only paid around 100 US dollars for this, maybe even less. This is a Breitling, probably keeps the worst time of any of my watches. Looks nice and sparkly, but I don't love it. Oh, okay, Seven Friday, very interesting design here. Uh, it's only about a thousand dollars, so it's not high end in terms of that respect. But it's just an interesting design, and I think it's the only all white watch I've ever seen. Once again, rarely wear that one. Now, F1 fans will know this watch. This is the big pilot's watch made by IWC. Sought after, you can still get them, but uh, yeah, I don't think this one's gone up terribly much in value, but lovely big watch. As the name suggests, it was probably worn by pilots at some point. That's a black face, black band. This is black face, black band, black bezel. Hamilton watch. I like these watches, they're quirky. And when I first got it, it grabbed me because of the fact that really it's only got a little bit of grey there, as you can see. But I liked it. It's one of two Hamiltons I've got. This is the other one. I got this primarily because it was to commemorate the air race, which was on in Perth at the time. And along the top here, you can actually see that it has Perth along with a whole lot of other cities that you can rotate around. And I like the orange band. Maurice Lacroix. I don't know why I got excited about Maurice Lacroix. I've got a second one here too. This one here is um, a pretty nothing sort of watch, but very slim, nice little dress watch not huge in the dollar value here but this I really like because it's got several complications date day month and importantly the moon phase which I really like is that working is that focusing this has moon phase on it so does this a Patek here this is a Maurice Lacroix both of them by the way have see-through backs which is a great novelty however this watch here is in the order of about 50,000 Australian dollars. This was in the order of about five, maybe six. They do exactly the same thing. It's just that this one has done better marketing and is better made perhaps, although I've never had a problem with either. Oh, and also this one has gold on it and this one's just stainless, I gather. You can easily go into any store and get one of these. Unlike Rolexes, like, uh, okay, so this one here is a Kermit. I don't know why it's called a Kermit. It's got green around the edge. This was the 50th anniversary model um, celebrating Rolex's 50th anniversary. I bought this in 2007, paid about 8,000 Australian for it. It's worth well over 20,000 now. And for many years, I didn't even wear this thing. I didn't really love the look of it, but since it's got quite highly sought after, I've worn it a few more times. And in fact, any of these stainless steel Rolex sports watches are highly collectible. Oh, and thanks to Kennedy.com too for sponsoring the channel. If you want the world's best online training, you should head to Kennedy.
www.rolexmobile.com. Another Rolex that is hard to get is this one. You'll know it as the Coke. Why is it called the Coke? Because it's got red and black. There are three, is it two or three other designs? There's a Pepsi, which is red and blue. And then there's the Batman and the Batgirl. The Batman is blue and black. And then the Batgirl is blue and black, but it has a different bracelet. But once again, if you can get yourself one of these, you can turn around and sell it straight away and make a profit of many thousands of dollars. Why? Because Rolex meters supply. They govern how many of these that they sell. And you know what? Jewelers don't even get told that they're getting them. They can't order them. They'll just roll up in their shipment and no jeweler ever turns one away. Has Formula One influenced me when it comes to watches? Yes. This was the very first watch that I bought. This is a Tag Heuer. And they've been sponsoring Formula One for as long as I can remember. Love this watch. It was my first high-end watch. It cost me 1200 Australian dollars and I'm thinking late 90s. I could find out by looking at that report, but I don't think it's going to influence anybody. Just a really lovely watch. I don't think it's appreciated any. Oh, at one stage, I got excited about Panerai. Panerai originally was a brand of watches worn by Italian seamen. And they've sort of traded on that heritage and past. But this one here is a GMT. It's got two different time zones. If I'm traveling overseas, I can keep the time in Perth all the time on my wrist. It has a nice leather band. This one is my favorite Panerai. This is the Daylight. It was worn by Sylvester Stallone in the movie Daylight, which I don't think I even watched. But once again, I read an article and thought, that's for me. Nice big face, very heavy watches. And this is Panerai's signature thing, this little lockdown crown here. It's one of three Panerais. This, oh, this is the one I'm looking for. Now, truth be known, this is my wife's watch. I got this for her. She doesn't wear it very often, it's quite heavy and thick and my eldest son has claimed this it has the signature clasp on the side as well five to go this one is an oris i don't even know why i bought that on the motoring theme this one here is a chopard which is i think chopards are a little bit jewelry type watches anyway pretty watch it's got a second hand it's got a timer stopwatch on it uh, this is the mille mille and Italians will correct me, I'm sure, if I've said that wrong. I do love this. This is a black-faced stainless steel Daytona. Once again, like the white face, very hard to find. And while I was shooting some vision for this video, I put these two watches together and I discovered something, something I perhaps should have known as a somewhat of an avid watch collector, that the second hand on the black watch is in a different spot than the second hand on the white watch. I never knew it. And I've had these watches for decades. So look at the white watch on this shot and you'll see that the second hand is not actually the hand that sweeps around. That's actually the stopwatch hand. The second hand on the white watch is the very left dial at nine o'clock. And yet for the next model up, they move the second hand to the six o'clock position. And I only just realized it. But the black face hasn't appreciated quite as much as the white face. And I'm guessing that's probably something to do with age and this one having a zenith movement, which apparently is of some note. White-faced Explorer. Once again, stainless steel model, hard to get. Hasn't gone up that much. Certainly appreciate it, but not in the realm of the other two. Oh, and then this one, there's quite a story to this. This is a Submariner. I bought this a little while back, and then I said to my son, my youngest one, if you get an ATAR score, which is an end of year mark for his final year of school, if you get an ATAR mark of 90 or more, I'll give you this watch. So he studied his ass off. And then we we're at the racetrack one day when he got his exam results and he looked at his phone and what a buzz that was. 90.5. 90.5. .5. He got 90.5. I owe him a Rolex watch. <laughs> so effectively, it's not mine anymore. But well done, Jace. Quite a lot of watches here. I love them. I love wearing them. I had a watch safe made many years ago. These are automatic. So all of these watches need to be wound. And normally, they'll be wound by the fact that they're on your wrist. But you can only ever, of course, wear one watch at a time. And then there's whatever this lot left here unwound. So by getting all these orbiter watch winders and putting them in a, in a safe like this, which is bulletproof glass, it's biometric installation, it's sunk into the uh, wall of the house. Um, it gives me the opportunity to keep all of them wound so that if I want to wear that one, I just pull it out, stick it on my wrist, I don't have to worry about winding the thing. I don't have to worry about setting the time. So it's a convenience, it's also safety.
I do love collecting watches and I'm certainly back on the collecting wagon again. I see the Rolex logo at the track a lot. I see the other brands as well, but I think I'm pretty much gonna buy Rolexes from now on because of their sought after status. And you've got to know a jeweler to get one. You can't just walk in and buy one. Otherwise they would be not going up in value like most other watches. Oh, somebody asked me, do I wear these when I go away to F1? I don't wear them if I go to somewhere like Mexico or Brazil or even Italy. It's just a bit too risky. But certainly when I go to like Australia or Abu Dhabi or um, Bahrain, there's no problem at all. But I am quite wary photographing out on the track where you've got metal around and fences that um, I don't want to scratch any of them. So it's not often I take one away. Hopefully you've learned a little bit about watch collecting and maybe I've inspired some of you to get out there and research and I, and I admit here that I've uh, been influenced in the past by F1 advertising, by Tag Heuer's sponsorship, by seeing the Rolex logo at the track, by reading articles in magazines like GQ, which funnily enough recently quoted me for one of my posts about Lewis Hamilton wearing one of these uh, big pilot's watches. I hope you will subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so. Click the like button, the bell button, the join button, any other button you see on there. You'll find all of my pictures at ProStarPics.com. You'll get my F1 photo books at KimElman.com. And for my best pictures live from the track, back there, I'm sure we will at some stage. You can find me on Instagram at KimElman. And with that said, I'm gonna say thanks for watching. Stay passionate. Why does that zap me all the time?